In this video, we're going to be continuing our discussion about certainty of objects. And in the previous video, we identified that a trust would be void if the objects of that trust, that is the beneficiaries of that trust, are uncertain. And we looked at uh, the different ways that we can identify the beneficiaries of a trust. And there are four ways that we can do that. There are named individuals, a group defined by a description, an organisation or association, and a general class of people. <clears throat> and we said that this second class, where the beneficiaries are identified by a description, and the third, where the beneficiaries is an organisation or association, are where the requirements or certainty of objects may be an issue. And so this leads us on to a discussion about fixed and discretionary trusts because this is where the tests are when it comes to certainty of objects. So let's get started. In cases where there is a fixed trust, where the trustee must divide the property in a set proportion between a fixed number of beneficiaries, then they must be able to say with certainty who the beneficiaries are. This is the list test, okay? It must be possible to construct a definitive list of who all the beneficiaries are. This is sometimes referred to as the class ascertainability, to, um, ascertainability test too. So a fixed trust, in other words, is one in which the share or interest of the beneficiaries is specified in the trust instrument itself. The beneficiary is the owner of the equitable interest that has been allocated to him. The situation is contrasted with a discretionary trust, which we'll look at in a minute, where the trustees hold the trust property on trust for such member or members of a class of beneficiaries as they shall in their absolute discretion determine. In that situation, no beneficiary owns any part of the trust fund unless and until the trustees have exercised their discretion in their favour. The point here is that if trust property is to be divided among beneficiaries in equal or in any other fixed shares, the trust cannot in the nature of things be administered unless the number and identity of beneficiaries are known. And it has been confirmed that in the case of a fixed trust, it must be possible to identify each member of the class of beneficiaries. So there is a list test to determine the beneficiaries. The requirement for the trust to be upheld is that a list will be able to be drawn which is on the balance of probabilities complete. So if you create a fixed trust for property to be divided equally among current Oxford University students, if you could come up with a list of all current Oxford University students, you would pass the list test and the trust would be upheld. However, if you cannot list all the potential beneficiaries, you cannot administer the trust property. There are difficulties with this class as we have to consider whether students who withdrew from the university in the past couple of weeks but haven't been taken off the university books, are they a member of this class and therefore entitled as beneficiaries or not? So that is one potential problem of this particular class of beneficiaries. So it's not always clear, even when it seems clear, um, at first glance. So yeah, it can be a challenge coming up with this particular list. So on the other hand, that was the fixed trust. We also have the discretionary trust, as I just referenced. And in a discretionary trust, where the trustees have the discretion to apply the trust fund to a number of or class of people, the current test is the is or is not test. So a discretionary trust is a trust whereby the trustees are required to exercise their discretion to select the beneficiaries from among a class of objects and or to determine the, the quantum of interest that the beneficiaries may enjoy. And the modern test for certainty of objects in respect for discretionary trust is known as the individual ascertainability test or the is or is not test or the any given postulum test. So we've got a few different names for essentially the same thing. So as said before, the test to be applied to determine certainty of objects depends upon the nature of the trust. In these circumstances, the court is more flexible to uphold the trust. 
So for a trust where the property is left for the benefit of the testator's wife during her lifetime and thereafter to be divided equally between the testator's children, it must be said it must be possible to say who the testator's children are. Where there is a discretion or a power, the is or is not test applies. And we've got a case here of MacPhail and Dalton and in this case, it was said, the distinction between a trust and a mere power can be stated shortly, although the short statement will require some explanation. It is that where there is a trust, there is a duty imposed upon the trustees, who can be controlled, if necessary, in the exercise of their duty. Whether the trust is discretionary or not, the court must be in a position to control its execution in the interest of the objects of the trust. Where there is a mere power, entirely different considerations arise. So with a discretionary trust, the trustees must exercise their discretion. But with a power, the trustees may exercise their power. In other words, the trustees have a discretion as to whether they want to divide the property. There is no obligation to do so. The objects have no right to complain, whereby the instrument creating the power the discretion is made absolute and uncontrollable, the court cannot interfere. The trust in default controls, and he to whom the trust results in default of exercise of the power is in practice the only one competent to object to a wrongful exercise of the power by the donee. So if you are the beneficiary of a discretionary trust and the trustees, trustees don't do their job, you can complain. If the trustees have a power, then you have no right to complain as a beneficiary. So this is really just showing us how a power is different from a um a discretion from from a discretion. So there is a clear distinction between trusts, a discretionary trust, and powers, okay? And I just want to reiterate the point because I'm not too sure how clear I was then. So trusts impose obligations on a trustee which the trustee is required to perform in obedience to the terms of that trust. Breach of such obligations will render the trustee personally liable to account to the beneficiaries for any loss suffered and thus to restore the value of the trust fund if the original trust property cannot be recovered. Equally significantly, under a trust that is a discretionary trust, the beneficiary acquires proprietary right in the trust property. The, trust, the trustee owns fiduciary obligations to the beneficiary further to the trust. Okay? By contrast, an ordinary power, which is not in the form of a trust obligation, creates no such proprietary rights in any beneficiary, but may impose fiduciary obligations on the hold of the power. Such, power, uh, such powers are referred to as mere powers because they create no trust. So fixed trusts again. Now, although I already covered fixed trusts a second ago, I just want to just recap and drill this knowledge into your head some more. Now, a fixed trust refers to those situations in which the trust provision requires the property to be held for a fixed number of beneficiaries. So let's think of another, another example would be £10,000 to be held upon trust equally for the complete team of 11 Chelsea football club players um, who played in the Champions League final in 2012, I think it was. Okay, This is a fixed trust because the property is to be held equally for this class of people such that it is necessary to know how many of them and uh, um, how many of them are who they are before the trust can be administered. Okay, It is only possible to divide property equally if you know the number of people between whom that property is to be divided. In such a situation, it is necessary for the trustees to be able to produce a complete list of all the beneficiaries so for there to be sufficient certainty as to the beneficiaries. Okay, So in this Inland Revenue Commissions and Broadway case, the trust failed because they could not identify the list of beneficiaries. So the property was held on a resulting trust back to the settler. Okay, The House of Lords confirmed 
this Inland Revenue Commission's and Broadway Cottages case in the case of Goldbankian's settlement. Okay, and this is a key case. So in this case, Lord Upjohn said that then taking it one stage further, suppose the donor directs that a fund or the income of a fund should be equally divided between members of a class. The class must be identified as the individual. The court cannot guess at it. Suppose the donor directs that a fund be divided equally, equally between my old friends. Then unless there is some admissible evidence that the donor has given some special dictionary meaning to that phrase, which enables the trustees to identify the class with sufficient certainty, it is plainly bad as being too uncertain. So, just to clarify, in relation to establishing the certainty of objects under a fixed trust, it is necessary for the trustees to be able to compile a complete list of the beneficiaries, as required by Broadway Cottages and by the dicta of Lord John, Lord Upjohn sorry, in this particular case. That means that the trustees must be able to name each possible beneficiary or to identify all of the members of the appropriate class. If there are any objects about whom the trustees could not be certain, or if the trustee is not able to compile such a list, then the trust will be void for uncertainty. And discretionary trusts again. So I just want to again reiterate the points I've been making earlier because people are getting confused between the distinction between fixed trust, discretionary trust and power. So I just want to clarify this as much as possible. So discretionary trust is one in which the trustees have the discretion to decide how the property is to be divided, but no power to divide it. For example, where property is given to a widow for her life, where the property to be divided among the settler's children as the trustees decide. In this case, the trustees are obliged to exercise their discretion. So the discretionary trusts require that the trustees exercise their discretion and carry out their power, rather than being a fiduciary mere power which enables but does not require the exercise of their trust obligations. In the following example, the terms of the trust provide that the trustee shall exercise the discretion, thus making its exercise by the trustee compulsory. So the trustee shall divide £1,000 between any of my sons who become unemployed. In this example, the trustee is subject to a discretionary trust because the trust provides that the trustee shall divide the £1,000. The word shall indicates compulsion and thereby a discretionary trust power rather than a mere power. And we've got this case of Ogden from 1933 and um, the testator left money to Sir Herbert Samuel to be distributed among organisations promoting liberal principles in politics. Sir Herbert said that he would be able to make a complete list of all such organisations and it was held there was no uncertainty and there was a valid trust. Now, this is the old law, okay, as we've already seen where the trust property is to be divided into specific shares, that is a fixed trust, it is necessary for the trustees to know exactly how many beneficiaries there are. So, in other words, apply the list test. And in, until 1971, the same rules actually applied to discretionary trusts. So, until 1971, the list test was also applied to discretionary trusts. And in this case, Sir Herbert Samuel was given money as a trustee to exercise a discretion to divide the trust money amongst organisations promoting liberal uh, principles in politics and the court applying the old law enforced the list test. In other words, if the trust was able to inf uh, was to be enforced, Sir Herbert Samuel would have to make a complete list of all such organisations. He did provide such a list, although this would have actually been impossible and the court believed it was a complete list. So the trust was held to be valid and there was no uncertainty. However, the list test is no longer applied in cases involving a discretionary trust, as I've already mentioned. Since, 1970, since the 1971 case of McPhail and Dalton, um, this has now changed, and this case now provides the current law. So, the requirements for a complete list in a discretionary trust has been relaxed in the case, or since the case of McPhail and Dalton. 
So in this case, someone left money on trust for the benefit of the staff of a company and their dependents. The trust deed gave the trustees the following discretion. The trustees shall apply the net income of the fund in making at their absolute discretion grants to or for the benefit of any of the officers and employees or ex-officers and or ex-employees of the company or to any relatives or dependents of any such persons in such amounts at such times and on such conditions, if any, as they think fit. It was held that in such a case it was not necessary to draw up a complete list of persons who might be qualified as beneficiaries. Of course, determining um, and making up a list of all the relatives or dependents would have been extremely difficult, so the court held it was not necessary to do so. The test for the validity of trust powers ought to be similar to that accepted by this house in Goldbunkian settlement for powers. Namely, that the trust is valid if it can be said with certainty that any given individual is or is not a member of the class. So the leading case regarding the test for certainty in relation to discretionary trust is the House of Lords decision here in McPhail and Dalton. Their lordships adopted the Golbenkian's test of the is or is not test for discretionary trust. So this means that the test for mere powers and discretionary trusts are therefore brought into line, meaning the need to distinguish between them for practical purposes is fairly unimportant. In Macphail and Dalton, payments were made in favour of employees uh, or ex-officers or ex-employees of the company or any relatives or dependents of any such persons. So the question of uncertainty surrounded the expression relatives and dependents in particular. The question arose as to the appropriate test to decide the question of certainty of beneficiaries. And the House of Lords adopted the is or is not test set out in um, Golbenkian in relation to discretionary trusts. Therefore, in considering the certainty of beneficiaries under a discretionary trust, it must be possible for the trustees to say of any postulant whether that person is or is not within the class of beneficiaries. If it is impossible to tell whether or not one individual falls within the class or not, that trust power fails. Okay? On the facts of this case, the House of Lords decided that the term relative could be rendered certain if it were interpreted to mean descendants of a common ancestor, although this expression seems a bit confusing, um, and just as confusing as the term relative, because arguably we're all uh, descendants of a common ancestor, so who knows. So yeah, that is the discretionary trust, and I have really reiterated the same point over and over again about fixed and discretionary trust, and I, I apologise if I've made this more confusing than it needed to be, but I'm trying to just reiterate the points um, necessary for you to understand the distinction between fixed and discretionary trusts and how the court has approached both of them. I'm very quickly just going to cap this off with a quick look at powers as an individual point and specifically the Goldbank in settlement. So, Lord Wilberforce in this case said, but with respect to mere powers, while the court cannot compel the trustees to exercise their powers, yet those entitled to the fund in default must clearly be entitled to restrain the trustees from exercising it, save among those within the power. So the trustees or the court must be able to say with certainty who is within and who is without the power. So a mere power is not a fully-fledged trust obligation. It simply gives the holder of the power the ability to exercise that power without any obligation to do so. Note that this person isn't actually a trustee, but the power can be given within a trust document. So an example of a fiduciary mere power would be the trustees may advance £1,000 to X. As opposed to an example of a trust obligation, which might read, the trustees shall pay £1,000 to X annually. In the former case, the trustee is able to pay £1,000, but is under no compulsion to do so, whereas the second example compels the trustee to pay £1,000 to X. The leading case with fiduciary mere powers is the House of Lords 
decision in this case, and the case established a test, which we shall refer to as the is or is not test, okay, which means that the trustees must be able to decide whether any hypothetical beneficiary is or is not within the class of objects. And the case reversed the previous rule which had required the trustees to be able to draw up a complete list of beneficiaries. And this older approach meant that if it was not possible for the trustees to compile a complete list of the class of beneficiaries in advance of exercising the trust, then the trust would be held to be void. The majority of the House of Lords in this case took a different approach. It was found instead that for a trust to be valid, the trustees must be able to say of any postulant, that is any person claiming entitlement under a trust or power, coming before the trustees claiming to be a beneficiary, that the person was either within the class of beneficiaries or was not within the class of beneficiaries. In short, to validate a fiduciary mere power, you must be able to tell whether any given individual is or is not within the class of objects. As Lord Upjohn puts it, the trustees or the court must be able to say with certainty who is within and who is without the power. So if there's even one person in relation to whom the trustees cannot decide whether or not she falls within the class of, of, of class of objects, then the trust is invalid. Okay, this the is or is not test is consequently still a strict test, whereby any uncertainty as to whether or not any hypothetical postulant is or is not within the class of objects will invalidate the fiduciary mere power. Okay. Now. It might be helpful to take an example to illustrate how this test works. So suppose a fiduciary mere power contained in a trust document, which provided that the trustees may pay £10,000 to any of my good friends whom they shall deem worthy of it. The problem of certainty of objects here is bound up in the use of the expression, my good friends, okay? We must establish whether or not the objects of this power the settler's good friends, are sufficiently certain. And so the trustees are bound by the is or is not test. So let's try and bring this test to life. We should imagine the trustees sitting in a room behind a long desk facing the door. Okay, One by one, a hypothetical queue of people come into the room claiming to fall within the class of objects. These claimants are postulants. Okay. For the power to be valid, the trustees must be able to say of any person who comes through the door claiming to fall within the class, whether or not that person is indeed within or outside the class of objects. This means they must be able to say with certainty either that each postulant is or that each postulant is not within the definition of the class. If there is even one postulant about whom they could not be certain, then the power will be void. And remember, the is or is not test also applies to discretionary trusts. So this is powers, but it also applies to discretionary trusts. So where there is a discretionary trust, there is no need to create a complete list of postulants. In other words, they do not need to know the identity of the objects in advance and instead may be able to wait to examine each postulant as the circumstances arise. Therefore, if it is not possible to determine whether a postulant does or does not fall within the class of beneficiaries, then the discretionary trust will be void. Right. I think that is enough for one video because that nicely wraps up our discussion about fixed trust, discretionary trust and powers. And we can see nicely how all of those three things relate together. In the next video, we're going to be looking at the various forms of uncertainty when it comes to certainty of objects, specifically stuff like conceptual uncertainty, evidential uncertainty, ascertainability and administrative workability. But if you have any questions about this particular video about discretionary trust, fixed trust and powers, and how these particular tests are applied in relation to certainty of objects, then please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel, and thank you very much for watching.